Well, let's open our Bibles to Ezekiel 36. And in just a moment, we're going to look at the whole purpose of prophecy. Sometimes we're confused. Prophecy, biblical prophecy, often divides people into camps. You know, those are for, those are against, those are who are extreme and those who try and moderate. But really, the, the purpose of prophecy, God explains to us. And it, it helps give you a little better perspective on exactly what the Lord is up to, uh, especially when we back off and look at the, the larger picture of his word. But in the Bible, the God who recorded the beginning that no one but him witnessed And he does that in Genesis. Remember, it's the only true scientific account because it was observed. Remember, most scientists didn't observe except one, creation. So we only have one scientific record, and that's in Genesis. It was observed by the creator himself and written down. But he's also the God who gives us the ending. And that ending, no one but him could ever have written. Because he wrote it thousands of years ago. And he named geographic places and ethnic groups of people thousands of years ago. And he tells us that those people are going to be alive and that they are going to be the powder keg flashpoint that's going to precipitate the end. So no one but God could have written that. And we find that in the book of Revelation and other places in the Bible. Isn't it amazing that God devotes one-fourth or 25% of the Bible to the ending. That shows how important it is to him and how important it should be to us. The ending, as portrayed in the Bible, is the indivisible union that the world's destiny has with God's chosen people of promise. He identified as Israel. And the city that God chose above all other cities on earth that he identified as Jerusalem and the group of people that he said he set his love upon, not because they were more lovable or because they deserved it, just because he chose them. And they are called the Jews. Never forget the centrality of Israel in the Bible. Now let me give you a quick And every so often I do this, I revert back to my years of lecturing in seminary. So some of you that don't like lectures, you can kind of pull out your video game for a minute, because I know you all carry them in your pockets, okay? Uh, And you say you're looking at the Bible on them, but I know what you're really doing, because I have one in my pocket, okay? So, uh, but Israel is the third most mentioned topic in the Bible. Did you know that? Right after God, he's the most. He's mentioned over 12,000 times in the Bible. Specifically, the name God is 4,094 times, Lord 6,781, plus if you add Jesus and Christ in spirit, you get way past 12,000. So God himself is the most mentioned subject in the Bible. Number two is salvation. Man, sin, Jesus, cross, sacrifices, salvation makes up the second after God, salvation is the second biggest topic in the Bible. But number three is Israel. Israel is mentioned specifically over 2,900 times, Jerusalem 767 times, and that far overshadows the church that's only mentioned 111 times, prayer 128, and the cross 29 times. Now, they're all important, but if you really believe God engineered the Bible, you can tell a lot about a person by what they talk about all the time. You can tell if they're into sports or into finances or into cars or you know, into girls or whatever they're into. They talk about it all the time. Or themselves, they talk about whatever's important. Well, over 200 times God introduces himself. Remember, the name Jehovah means the I am, the great I am. Not the great I was, not the great I will be, but the great I am. Remember, he never changes. Remember, immutability, one of the great truths about God. Over 200 times, God introduces himself as, I am the God of Israel. So, immutability, see, that's where we get this whole stream of thought and theology. They don't want to deny the immutability of God, and God is always going to be the God of Israel, and so they just redefine who Israel is and make Israel the Protestant church of today or since the Reformation or something because God doesn't change. 
But God didn't just say, I'm the God of Israel. He says, I am the God of Abraham. He says, I am the God of Jacob. Jacob, supplanter, liar, cheat, trickster. God says, I am the God. I am forever known as the God of Jacob. In fact, God names the entrance gates to heaven after the 12 sons of the deceiver Jacob himself. And I wonder what those theologians that believe in replacement, what they replace that with. You know, it's, it's amazing that God merges the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles in heaven and shows that he's not through with either group. And he's eternally going to remember both groups. Over 200 times he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is not the I was, he is the I am. And he is, he was, and has promised in the future that he will be the God of Israel. And so, if you just take your Bible, and for just a minute, just turn to the table of contents. It should be way up in the front. I want to show you something that you may never have thought of. Now, some of you do look in there so often when I call off a book you haven't uh, been to for a while. But look in the table of contents and just... With your eyes, go down with me, and I want to show you, because if you look at the table of contents of the Bible, you kind of get a a little sense of what's important to God, okay? The first, and by the way, my Bible has 1,100 pages, and I have one of those that doesn't have any notes in it. It's just the text, and there's no charts, and there's no footnotes or anything. So the Bible is around 1,000 pages in normal size, or maybe 1,100. So in that Bible, and however many pages you have, Watch out for your study notes. They can bulk up the numbers and show different percentages. But the first 600 pages in my Bible, from Genesis to the Song of Solomon, so look in your table of contents, you see what a big chunk that is. Those books are all about Israel's origin, their history, their wanderings away from God, and their worship to the living and true God. So that's 54% of the Bible. You say, wait a minute, not all of Genesis is about Israel. Really? Really? Israel was one through whom Christ would come. And so God starts in Genesis and in chapter 3 says he's going to be the seed of the woman. And Satan starts watching that and God keeps delineating down who that chosen line will be until it gets to Abraham. And that's in chapter 11. So you might say that the first 10 chapters aren't. But the table of nations and all those genealogies are to prove the succession through the chosen line. So really, maybe the first four chapters aren't about Israel. But all the rest is. So the first 600 pages, or 54% of the Bible, so far is about Israel and their origin, history, wanderings away from God and back to God and their worship. The next 250 pages, that's from Isaiah to Malachi, speak of the doom coming first to Israel because of their unfaithfulness, and then the doom that is going to come upon the world. So again, it's still about Israel, and and everything about the future, if you look at the minor prophets, everything centers around Israel. In fact, everything to do with the end, Israel's always in the middle of it. I chuckle when I remember on the second row a few weeks ago, my Sunday school teacher growing up came from Lake Lansing Baptist Church to see if Johnny made it, you know, and she was sitting right there. Just seeing her reminded me that every time there was trouble in our Sunday school class, I was in the middle of it. Well, every time there's trouble... At the end of days, Jerusalem is in the middle of it. Israel is at the center of it. And the Jewish people are the focus of it. And that's how God said the ending would be. So the next 250 pages, if you look there in your Bible, or 23% of the Bible is devoted to Israel and looking toward the end of the world. So that's where we get fully 23% of the Old Testament is prophetic and theologically speaking, eschatological. Speaking of the end, heskatos, the ending, and, and the study of the ending. Now, look in your table of contents. The next 110 pages in my Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that means 10% of the Bible is devoted to the life of Christ. And that's a wonderful, probably some of all of our favorite part of the Bible. Then the next 120 pages are devoted to the record of Acts through Jude. And that explains Christ's church, the birth and the mission, and all of the doctrine and the polity for the church. And then the last about 20 pages of my Bible are Revelation, and it's the centrality of Israel and Jerusalem in the end of the world, and that's about 2% of the Bible. So roughly speaking, if you add together the Minor Prophets and the book of Revelation, that means that 25% of God's Word is about the end of the age, which will be completely surrounding the people 
the Jews, the nation Israel, and the city Jerusalem. So just simply glancing at your table of contents would make a reader conclude that Israel, Jerusalem, and the Jews are very important. Because if you add it up, God has chosen to devote four-fifths or 79% of the whole Bible to Israel, their origin, their calling, their chastisement, their return, and their future troubles that will engulf the whole world. Now, If you look at someone's budget and they devote 79% of it to something, you'd say, oh, that's pretty important to you. And, And if you look at someone's time, so if you look at the fact that God has revealed his voice to us, and almost 80% of his voice is talking about Israel, and not just in the past tense, a fourth of it's in the future tense. When the Old Testament prophets explained the future, they universally began with Israel. And all the details revolved around Jerusalem and the land. And every time Jesus explained how the world would end, Jesus starts with Israel, Jerusalem, and the Jewish people. That's Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. When Paul explains the end, he does the same thing. And I'm talking about Romans 9 through 11, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, and so on. As does John. So every Old Testament writer, Jesus, and every prophetic New Testament writer all see the same thing. The world ends, and the center of the focus of the world is the whole world attacking the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, and the city of Jerusalem. That's the whole Bible in a nutshell. And so God literally keeps his promises to Israel. Now, for just a moment, we're in Ezekiel 36. I want you to see with me tonight, we're we're on, if any of you are keeping track, we're on the 10th of 12 promises God made to Israel. And what I want to do with you tonight is I want you to step back and look with me, how did God keep his promises to Israel? Are they vague? Are they allegorical? Are they incomprehensible, we aren't sure how he kept them? Or, as we look at each one, can we honestly say, in fact, with half of them, all you have to do is go to the public library and don't even go to the Christian section, go to the secular section. Half of all God's promises to Israel are recorded in universally accepted history. I'm not talking about creationism, you know, Ken Ham and the Institute of Creation Research. I'm talking about Any secular, even Muslim publication will acknowledge at least five of God's ten promises as literally happening. And the other five, if they're honest, they would acknowledge too, but it gets uncomfortable. But we cling to the God who keeps his word. God has made many promises, and he keeps them. God has promised, I will never leave you or forsake you. What does that mean? Well, we're not sure. It could be allegorical. No, we just believe if he promises something, we believe that he means what he says. God says, I will never leave you. I will come again for you. I'm preparing a place for you, et cetera, et cetera. And so when, we, when he says that, we say, mm-hmm, he means it. Well, God made 10 similar direct promises that we're going to look at tonight and more that we'll look at in the future, Lord willing. And everyone, you can believe. Because the nine up through tonight's, he's already kept. Tonight's, you're seeing in the news. Uh, Even tonight, uh, the newswire said that, that Syria bought from North Korea miniature submarines. Plus, what we would call weapons of mass destruction. You know, Korea isn't a happy place to be for Christians, and it's a really haven for for anything destructive. And they are shipping to Syria uh, chemical weapons. I mean, you know, I mean, this is nothing new. It's in the news all the time. And these midget submarines where they can plant mines, where they can bring up, you know, commandos to the shore and have them infiltrate and do terrorist attacks. Amazing stuff that's going on. And as God speaks in Ezekiel 36, always remember... The purpose of prophecy is for God to authenticate his identity. Prophecy is the proof that God is God alone. 
and his name is not Allah. And that's what the end of the world is about. One point however many billion people are willing, most of them, to die for Allah. And the true and living God says, that's not who I am. And I'm going to show you, because I'm going to make one group of people, Israel, be the ones that I attach my honor and my name to. And send the whole world against them. The world will not be able to destroy them. It's kind of like king on the mountain, you know, when you play snowballs and say, I'm the king, and everyone attacks you and blasts you with snowballs, and you get knocked down. God says, I'm the king of the mountain. Israel, I'm defending. Take me on. And that's how the world ends, when they take him on. Well, Ezekiel 36, we're going to start in verse 20, and we'll read a few verses there, and then on to verses uh, in chapter 39. Let's listen to his voice. Ezekiel 36, verses 20 and onward. And this is what the Lord says. And by the way, it's not just in these verses, but I'm just pointing them out. And I hope that as you see these and as you read Ezekiel in the days ahead, and you should read Ezekiel because you're going to be with him in heaven, okay, if you're a believer. Wouldn't you hate to be at the coffee pot in heaven and say, hey, who are you? And you say, Ezekiel, say, oh, where are you from? He looks at you and says, your Bible. (laughs) You go, oh, I didn't read the Old Testament. Okay, here we go. Look at verse 20 uh, and onward. Uh, When they came... To the nations, wherever they went, Ezekiel thirty six twenty, they profaned my holy name when they said of them, these are the people of the Lord, yet they have gone out of his land. So see, God says every time the people he expelled, the Jews, were wandering through the earth, people profaned God's holy name when they remembered that they had been God's people and they'd been ejected. Keep reading to verse 21. But I had concern for my holy name. That's the whole purpose of prophecy. God says, I'm going to protect my name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. So see, the whole purpose is, God says, those people that I ejected, I'm going to bring back, and I'm going to bring them to honoring my name, which they're not there yet. Israel's facing the worst water crisis. They're buying water from the Muslims. You know they're desperate. If they're buying water from the Muslims, they're buying tankers of water. Their, their, their aquifer is, is going down into the red zone and beyond. It's going to be uh, saline water soon coming up. The Sea of Galilee is dropping so fast. You know what Benjamin Netanyahu should do? He should come out and say to the whole nation, everybody come out of your houses, look up. True and living God of Israel, please let it rain. You know what? They would have a deluge. God always said, I'll withhold the reins until you acknowledge me. So if anybody knows him, tell him. Go outside and pray. Okay, look at chapter 39, verse 7. Ezekiel 39, 7. And this is just another, and you can find this all the way through the book of Ezekiel. 39, 7. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. See, God is going to protect them even when they don't want to be protected, even when they don't know they need protection, even when there is no way they could be protected. God is going to protect them as all the nations of the earth surround them and besiege them, and specifically Russia and Iran and Syria and every other Muslim nation comes in hordes on them. And they're right at the end, and they're overwhelmed. Look what God says in verse 7. I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. Then the nations, that's all the ones attacking them, shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Israel. There was no Israel from 586 B.C. to 1948 A.D., That's a long time. And God says, I'm going to do this in Israel. So he couldn't do it until after 1948. And it's amazing. Keep going down to verse 25. Same chapter. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, now I will bring back the captives of Jacob and have mercy on the whole house of Israel, and I will be jealous for my holy name. Purpose of prophecy is God is showing that he is the one true and living God. And his signature, his authentication is, he said, I'm the only one that can tell you the future. And he's told us what's going to happen. Let's bow before him in prayer. Father, I pray tonight, in these few moments we have, that we will glean from your word a sense that you are the God we can trust. And we would trust you with more and more of our lives 
And if, if we can trust you and you say that you honor those who go for you and speak, may we go for you and speak. And if you said that you honor those who pray and you collect all our prayers, help us to be drawn to prayer. And if you said that you honor those who invest their treasures with you, may we invest our treasures with you. Oh, Lord, you have said the greatest thing we can do in our life is serve you. And none of us know what lies ahead in our lives, even if we'll be alive tomorrow. But may we know one thing for sure. As long as we are conscious, we are going to be your servants. And we're going to check in with you and say, Lord, we want to fulfill your desires, your purpose, your plan. We want to serve you. And Lord, I pray that we would have the joy and the confidence of knowing that our lives are count invested in service for you. Open our hearts to your truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hold tight. Here we go. I'm going to go through the promises. Uh, All of you that were here uh, when I started, I read all these to you, but I'm going to read them to you again. Number one, if you go to Genesis chapter 12 or just write it down, This is what God says. He has made promises to identify Israel as the nation that will signal the end of days. God verified every time he keeps his promise that the Jews, the nation of Israel, are his chosen people, he keeps his promises too. And so each of these has been fulfilled. Number one, God promised to Abraham in Genesis 12, 13, 15 onward that his descendants would be the chosen people and he would give them clearly defined boundaries. It's called the promised land. God promised a land to Abraham's descendants. That's the nation of Israel living in those boundaries. Well, God gave him that promise and renewed it to his son Isaac, Abraham's son Isaac, to his grandson Jacob, and to their descendants after them forever. And that's all the way through Genesis through Joshua. And that promise God fulfilled. How did he fulfill it? Literally. God promised and gave them, and they moved in to a literal land. So number one, God promised, and that's the literal history of the Jews. From any historical, secular source, God kept his promise and fulfilled what he said literally. You know, it's amazing. No one disputes the fact that that the Jews lived there. It's just they dispute the fact that today they deserve to live there. But no one disputes the fact that they lived there. Number two, God promised that Moses would divinely bring the chosen people of destiny to the promised land out of Egypt. That's Exodus 6, verses 7 and 8. And guess what? For 3,500 years, all over the world, every Passover, it's celebrated universally. And all the world, even that doesn't like Judaism, will even put into the grocery stores the stuff that those Jews want to buy so that they can have their little feast that celebrates the literal event that even, that even secular people acknowledge. In fact, there's a, um, uh, a man, that, that, uh, an Egyptian Muslim scholar, that was trying to file suit against Israel in the world court for all the gold the Jews took out of Egypt when they left in the Exodus. Do you know what he was doing? He was acknowledging that they did leave as a nation, from Egypt to the promised land. So they retracted that suit because it was, a, it was a proof of the validity of the Jewish people. But how did God fulfill that promise to Moses? The literal history of the Jews from any historical secular source shows us God kept his promise and fulfilled what he said to them literally. Thirdly, the third one, God stakes his future reputation On a people he identified as a people of destiny. God says, I am going to identify with this group of people. And you know what? When they got into the promised land, what did he do? He wiped out the Canaanites. Did you know that secular people say Israel is horrible and their God is horrible because they exterminated the Canaanites? Do you know what they're saying? God literally fulfilled his promise. See, they don't look at it that way. They look at it like those barbarians. They killed all those Canaanites, those poor Canaanites. When the archaeologists go over there, they find this complete destruction level all the way through the the promised land. The cities, Hatzor is a city that was burned so intensely that it melted and glazed some of the rocks. It was so completely burned and destroyed, just like God said. 
just like it says in Joshua. So how did God keep that promise to give them a land that he staked out for them and put his name with? He fulfilled it literally. Then God says, I'll judge you, Second Chronicles 7.20, number four, and uproot you from the land if you don't obey me, if you worship other gods. And guess what? The northern tribes were uprooted in 722 B.C., just like God said, literally uprooted. The Assyrians came down, they just killed them wholesale and captured, enslaved all those that were left and hauled them out of the land in mass and put them up into the Fertile Crescent, up in the area of Assyria, up into the area of modern-day Iraq. They're still living there to this day. There's a huge Jewish population in Iraq, in Iran, because there's still remnants of the literal fulfillment that God said, 722 B.C., I'm going to uproot you, idolatrous people, from your land. 586, the Babylonians came down, did the same thing to the southern kingdom, the, the tribe of Judah. And so, number four, God promised that if they forgot him, he would uproot them. He did. And it's literal history, even Muslim history, that the Jews, in any historical source, were literally uprooted from their land and taken into captivity. Number five, God promised to scatter the unfaithful but chosen people of destiny to the furthest corners of the earth. You know what? The United Nations confirms that one. That one's from Deuteronomy 28 and verse 64. He said, I will scatter you among all nations. The United Nations counted the languages of the immigrants coming to Israel, and they stopped counting when they passed 100 Because there's nowhere in the world a hundred different languages are spoke, not even at the UN. Israel is the most diverse, the most cross-intercultural nation on earth. Because Jews have come back from well over a hundred different nations, literally scattered, as Deuteronomy 28.64 said, to the ends of the earth. So, how did God fulfill his fifth promise to them that he would scatter them? Not just, you know, kind of like poof them to just over the border. He said, I'm not just going to put you right outside the postage stamp of Israel. I'm going to put you so that there are now Jewish people that live in remote parts of India that are following exactly the same religious schedule that they follow in Jerusalem. And when the ethnologists go and study them, they say, where are you? And they say, oh, we're, we're Jews. We were, we were brought here on caravans, our forebears, that, that were sent out as slaves out of Israel by the Assyrians or by the Babylonians. And they live in, in mountainous areas of, of the, the regions of the Himalayas. There are other groups they found in China. There are groups all over the Soviet Union. There are groups all over Africa. There are groups all over the Middle East. There are groups all over Europe. Because God literally fulfilled that. Number six, God said he would put a curse on them. Not only would they wander, but they would be ridiculed. They would be in horror. Just read, again, the history of Europe. Pogroms, holocausts, murders, the, the, the whole inquisition, everything. How did God fulfill that sixth promise, that they would be an object of scorn and horror? Well, the literal history of the Jews from any historical secular source shows God kept his promise and fulfilled what he said literally. Number seven, God says in Hosea 9 that God would chasten his unfaithful people. In other words, he said not only would they be an object of horror and scorn and be persecuted, they would be chastened, that there would be constantly, there would be people against them that would be speaking against them. And we find that the the Roman Catholic Church under the leadership of a zealous priest by the name of Martin Luther who became the founder of the Lutheran Church, but he never lost his zeal to persecute the Jews. They were chastened as Christ killers. And the Jewish people not only have the the enmity of the Arabic people, but then they have the enmity of the Christian people as Christ killers. So God said they'd be chastened in Hosea 9.17. Literal history of the Jews from even a secular source says that they were literally, literally chastened. But God says in Jeremiah 30, he says, I base my name on them. I will never allow you to be completely destroyed, Jeremiah 30, 11. God promised to preserve the Jewish people wherever they went from annihilation. And you know what the history of the world says? Every time someone got close enough to, like 
uh, Haman, the Agagite, in, in the book of Esther, just when he got all the Jews into his sights, God thwarted his plan. When Hitler got him in his sights, God thwarted the plan. When the Romans had him in his sights, God thwarted the plan. God has never allowed them to be exterminated, nor shall he in the future. But God did say he would protect them. Literally, he has Finally, in Ezekiel 36, right where you are, if you look at verse 24, God says, I will take you out of all the nations and I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back to your own land. Guess what? That's what's happened in the last 61 years. Never before in history has this happened. Never before in history has there been a homeland for the Jews. Oh, they adopted America, Miami, New York City. Uh, they, they adopted, uh, you know, different parts of the world, and they have migrated there. Poland in the, in the turn of the century through 1939. But they've never had their own homeland until 1948. And now they've moved back in mass, and it's continuing And there are more Jews for the first time two years ago living in Israel than anywhere else in the world in all of history since they were deported in the times of the Bible. So did God keep his promise? Look at verse 35. God says, this land that was laid waste, Deuteronomy, I mean Ezekiel 36, verse 35, the land that was laid waste will become like the Garden of Eden. Israel exports more flowers to Europe than anyone else. Israel exports more fresh fruit and vegetables into Europe than anybody else. In fact, when they gave away the Gaza Strip to back to the Palestinians for a peace gesture, do you know what? Some of the most productive greenhouses in the world were lining the coastal strip that Israel had made literally billions of dollars from, that, that fed hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people from those high-tech greenhouses, and they turned those over to the Palestinian people. Do you know what they did? They destroyed them all. They don't want to grow food. They want to be refugees and have the whole UN help them. They don't want to work in Jewish greenhouses and make their own living, make billions of dollars selling fruit and vegetables and flowers. They destroyed every greenhouse. That shows you the animosity that is an everlasting hatred. Well, that's the literal history of the Jews from any historic secular source. So God has kept his promise. God has fulfilled what he said literally. God has kept his word to Israel each time he's made it. God gave Abraham a son, and through the succeeding generations, countless descendants. That was promise one. He fulfilled it literally. Promise two, God took them out of Egypt and literally into the promised land. That's promise two. Number three, God conquered the literal physical land for them. He fought alongside of them, and he gave them the promised land literally. Number four, God delivered them into literal captivity among their enemies. Number five, God saw that the Jews were literally displaced, enslaved, sold, and scattered to the ends of the earth from the promised land across the Middle East by caravan to Asia, Africa, by boat to Europe and America, and there's no spot on earth where Jews could not be found. So that was the literal fulfillment of his fifth promise. Number six, God allowed vicious, literal prejudice, hatred to be poured on the Jews ever since, and he made them uncomfortable in every land they've settled into. And that was exactly his sixth promise. Number seven, God made them feel after a while of persecution, unsettled and insecure and homeless in every land so that they would feel horror. That was his seventh promise. But his eighth promise, God kept them from literal extermination. God has kept the Jews from playing Holocaust and has not allowed them to go extinct. Even though they've been more hunted than any animal on earth, They haven't been allowed to be extinct. Even though they're not a protected species, they haven't been allowed by God to go extinct. And number nine, God's ninth promise, God has stirred their hearts. God has gathered the Jewish people bit by bit back to their geographic land. And God has allowed them for the first time in 2,600 years to have their own sovereignty over literal territorial boundaries the first time in 2,600 years, because he promised he would. He promised that he would bring back the two staffs, both halves, the northern and southern kingdom. And in 1948, there was no more northern kingdom and southern kingdom of Judah. There was one land called Israel, just like God promised. Well, all that to say, what's the next promise God made? Well, let's go to 
Zechariah 12. Now, you can quickly get there by going to Matthew and back up about four pages, okay? You can be a sword drill winner. That's what they used to teach us in Sunday school. If you want to get to Zechariah, go to Matthew and back up about three uh, pages. And Zechariah uh, will start in, in um, chapter 12, and I want to read to you a literal promise that God made to Israel. And God said this, God promised to make his chosen of people of destiny, a source of fear for the whole world, even though they are in unbelief in the promised land. So Israel, once they get this geographic entity with literal defensible borders, their first landing spot that's Jewish. That's why it's a beautiful sight to see the Jewish people get off airplanes when they come in Aliyah, when they come in to immigrate back to the land. They get off the plane, and as soon as they're on the last step, they, they fall to the ground and kiss the ground. Because for the first time in their lives, they're home. And they just, it, it's a moving sight to see them so thankful to be in the land. They call it ha Aretz. Well, God says once that happens, look at Zechariah 12, verses 2 and 3. God declared that in the last days before the Messiah's second coming, Jerusalem would become a cup of trembling and a burdensome stone for the whole earth, for everyone on earth. That's quite a claim to make. Before we read that verse, did you know Zechariah? I take once a year when we tromp around the Holy Land with a group of people, we walk down the Mount of Olives. We start at the top where Jesus ascended, and we we walk down to where Jesus wept over the city. And between where he ascended and where he wept, there's this little walkway on a really steep hill. And we're all walking like this, and no one wants to slip. And I always stop, and people bump into me. I say, if you look to your left, that's where Zechariah is buried, right there. And there's a cave, just, you know, it's... It's really messy and smelly because, you know, they use it for other things than it should be used for, but it's uh, right there. And I say, you don't go in, it's smelly, but right there is where Zechariah. Did you know when Zechariah, the one that wrote the book you're reading right now, when he wrote those words, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, those last three minor prophets are post-exilic. You know what that means? After Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the whole city and burned it, it was just a blackened heap of rocks. Remember how Nehemiah cried? When he saw them, wept for his people, he talked about the black, burned-out rocks. That's what Jerusalem looked like when Zechariah was writing this. So here's Zechariah, sitting up in the side of Mount of Olives, pen in hand, dipping in the ink, writing on the, the scroll what God was telling him to write. And every so often, he'd look up. And you know, kind of like us, he says, hmm, that sounds impossible to me. That this city, it wasn't a city. It was gone. It was just black rocks tumbled in the valleys, charred by, by fire. But look what he writes. I'm going to make, verse 2 of Zechariah 12, I, the Lord God, creator of heaven and earth, the, the, the God of this universe, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem. On that day, when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her. If you look in a 1,000 and 1,500 and 2,000-year-old commentary on these verses, and there are extant commentaries that old, you know what they say? Well, actually what they mean is by all of the people living in tents that live in the general area. Because they said, all the world is from the perspective of the burned out city. And it couldn't be the world. God, when he says the world, he couldn't mean the world. He must mean something other than the world. And so for hundreds and for thousands of years, when this prophecy that was written 2,600 years ago or 2,500 years ago was written, everyone said, no, it can't mean, look look again what verse 3 says, on that day, all the nations of the earth, are get, by the way, when, when Zechariah wrote that, it was physically impossible. You couldn't travel from all the nations of the earth to Israel with an army. They, I mean, they sailed at rowing speeds 
or blowing speeds. Those were the two choices, you know, rowing your boat or blowing with the wind. And, and they were so afraid of sailing that they never went outside of land. They, the, the Romans were the first ones that, that really perfected the deep keel, crossed the Mediterranean stuff. Everybody else hugged the coast. Can you imagine trying to bring an army from China? They'd die of frostbite or they'd drown, you know. But God says, no, no, I'm going to, at the end, because I'm the only one that's seen the ending, God says, on that day, all the nations of the earth are going to be gathered against her. And I will make Jerusalem, verse 3 says, an immovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. I love that. Now, there is a man that lives in Washington, D.C., and he's a prophetic guy, and he's a charismatic guy, and he always is sensational, but he has a hobby. And every time the United States forces Israel to make a concession, which we're doing right now, every time there's a major disaster in America. Now, it's just coincidental, but he has years of records of this. Every time our president makes the Israeli leaders sit down with the Muslim people who want to destroy them and annihilate them and make them give up the Gaza Strip, make them give up part of the West Bank, make them give up Hebron, make them give up Bethlehem, make them give up whatever they're giving up. Right now they want to give up the Golan Heights. Every time that happens, there's always a a Category 5 hurricane. There's always uh, some kind of natural disaster in America. Now, does the Lord tit for tat send those things? I don't know, but it's very interesting that God promised that whoever harms or curses Israel or makes them give up their land, he said, that I will deal with them. And it's amazing that when, when Britain turned their back on Israel, which they did, which they did by not helping the Jews have a homeland, even though they promised them one. When Britain did that, they have never come out of their decline. And now that America has started down that track, it's interesting whether in years to come people will look back and say that's when America started their decline. Because God said, I'll bless those that bless Israel, and I'll curse those that curse Israel. Well, keep reading. He says... On that day, verse 3, when all the nations of the earth are gathered. We've already seen in Ezekiel 36 and 39 that God will restore Israel in the last days for the sake of his name. Remember, that's the opening verses we stood and read. God says, I'm doing all this, not for them, for me. And God says, I am going to make all the nations of the earth march against Jerusalem, not for them, but for me. Because I'm going to look at the end of verse 3. I'm going to injure everyone that tries to move Jerusalem. Did you know King Abdullah II of Jordan said last week that Jerusalem is the red line, that Jerusalem must belong to the Muslims? Well, that was as clear as you can get. God says it's not going to. And he said, you just try That's what the whole prophetic writing is about. Well, what happens when they try? Turn back with me to Psalm 83. And I want to just show you something briefly before we go. Because, again, if you look at all commentators throughout history, there's almost universal agreement that Psalm 83 has never happened yet in history. So it appears, even though there's a whole group of people that think there's no prophecy in the Psalms, it appears that... In this Psalm of Asaph, the 83rd Psalm, it speaks of a conspiracy against Israel. But the named people, it would be like saying that America was attacked by Napoleon, Genghis Khan, and Stalin. Immediately you'd know that that was an anachronistic statement, right? It's it's against chronology and anachronism. It doesn't fit. Because Genghis Khan would be from the 14th century and Stalin would be from the 19th century and so, and Napoleon would be from the 18th century and so we would have trouble, we would have trouble having those things all happening at the same time. It's an anachronism. Well, this prophecy of Psalm 83 lists off the enemies of Israel for a thousand years. But none of them were enemies all contemporaneously. But the 83rd Psalm says, and if you look at 
verse 5, you can read the whole thing. Uh, you know, verse 4, let's cut them off, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. Verse 5, they consulted with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. And look at what they are. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites. Moab and the Hagrites. Gebal, Ammon, Amalek. Wait a minute. Amalek was destroyed uh, almost completely by Saul. But Amalek is contemporaneous with the Edomites, who went well into the Roman period. Philistia. Philistia was wiped out by Alexander the Great in the 3rd century B.C. I mean, these are all... But it says at one time, all of these, with the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria... Wait a minute. Assyria is going to join with the Edomites, is going to join with the Amalekites? No. Assyria destroyed them all. Assyria destroyed the, the cities, and, and Alexander came through right behind them and finished them off. They have helped the children of Lot, Selah. Well, basically, if you, if you got a map and looked at verse 6, verse 7, and verse 8, verse 6 would be a description, the first half of it, of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia are the Edomites and the Ishmaelites, the the desert-dwelling people. Esau's kids and Ishmael's kids, they went east. Remember, Abraham gave them gifts and said, go east, go east, and they did. Moab and the Hagrites and Ammon and some of the Amalekites would be what is in the modern Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. If you know anything about history, the founder of Jordan was expelled. You know, he had the claim to Mecca, and he got ousted by the Saudi family, the House of Saud. And so he went over and started Jordan, the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. The Hashemites were the custodians of Mecca. But that Moab, Hagrite, Gebal, Ammon, and Amalek would describe Jordan today. I mean, not those people. They don't live there. But that area where they lived is modern-day Jordan. So we've got Saudi Arabia in the first part of 6, and the end of 6 in the first part of 7, we have Jordan. Then Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre. So Philistia is clear. That's the Gaza Strip. That's called Hamas today, Hamastan. The inhabitants of Tyre, that's in Lebanon. We have constant news reports about Lebanon. I mean, just in the last two weeks, uh, arms uh, caches have blown up up there, mysteriously. Uh, There are huge Palestinian refugee camps that are nothing but terrorist training grounds and bomb-making centers. Tyre and Philistia are certainly enemies, but we would call them today the Gaza Strip and Lebanon. And then Assyria... Assyria, at the first part of chapter, or I mean of verse 8, would be the modern-day area of Iran. But if you look at ancient maps of the Persian, Medo-Persian Empire, Iran, in biblical times, would designate not just Persia uh, or Iran of today, but Afghanistan, and guess what else? Pakistan. Have you noticed what's happened in the last month? Afghanistan, the war has turned. Now we say it's because we haven't surged our troops and everything, but everyone knows you can't conquer Afghanistan. You can't have a big enough army because you can't supply it. If you have too small an army, they pick you off one at a time. No one, Alexander couldn't do it. The Soviets couldn't do it. The British didn't do it. And America can't do it unless we use all drones. But how do you win the land from the air? You know, aerial bombardment doesn't really win land. It's, It's infantry, but... What's interesting is the, the Islamic, whatever you want to call it, Taliban or Al-Qaeda or whatever you want to call it, the, the people who believe the Quran, those people are exporting their warfare. They have surrounded all the atomic weapons of Pakistan. There is a ferocious fight going on in Pakistan right now, and they have atomic weaponry, missiles and all. And The Iranians are helping the Afghanistan Taliban to attack Pakistan and destabilize it and take it over. And you know what will happen? I'm not a prophet, but God says the region that used to be the Medo-Persian Empire is going to be united against Israel. And you're seeing in the news today Iran, 
helping Afghanistan take over Pakistan. And you're going to have the old Medo-Persian Empire back. And they're going to be atomic armed and pointed at Israel. That's exactly what this says. This says, verse 6, Saudi Arabia, that's Edom and Ishmael, is going to join with Jordan, that's Moab, the Hagrites, Gebal, Ammon, and Amalek, with the Gaza Strip, Hamas, that's Philistia, the inhabitants of Tyre, that's Lebanon, with Assyria, that's Iran, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, and they will help the children of Lot. Basically, the children of Lot, they, they settled going upwards, and they are Moab and Ammon were the children of Lot who would extend up past Jordan into what is modern-day Syria. And there you've just named everybody that hates Israel, that lives around them. And all of those people, it says in Psalm 83, are going to come and they're going to attack Israel. And look what the Lord does in verse 9. Deal with them like Midian as with Syria or, or with Sisera, with Jabin at the book of Kishon. If you know anything about biblical history, remember he's the one that got the tent, paint, uh, uh, tent stake right through his temple. I mean, that's being dealt with. Uh, Remember, uh, he comes to the tent in JL while she, this, this charioteer is resting. She puts a tent stake and takes the big mallet and goes, Phew. that's where the expression she really nailed her man came from. You know, I mean, that's literal, so watch out. But keep going. Here's what God does in verse 13. Oh, my God, make them like the whirling dust like the chaff before the wind. What's interesting is Isaiah 17 and Jeremiah 49 both use the exact same words and say that when this happens, there is a whirlwind. There's such an extreme destruction going on. Well, all that to say that this group, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, the Palestinians, the Lebanese, Iraq, Syria, are going to attack Israel. Why? And let's close with back to Zechariah 12. And we have to go. Zechariah 12. I left out the first verse. Did you notice that? I start in verse 2. Do you know what the best verse of all the, the prophetic uh, is Zechariah 12 is? It's the first verse of the 12th chapter. Because what it says is, this is the purpose of prophecy. The burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. Remember, all of this is happening as Jacob's trouble. God is bringing Israel to the end of themselves. Now, they are so amazing. They just creatively bring up the neatest stuff. I mean, they invent stuff all the time that is unbelievable. Uh, And I won't even go into all their inventions. They just just brought out stuff that that is, is amazing, and they sell it all over the world. The Israeli aircraft industry is owned by the government. They fund their fight against the Muslims by selling weaponry to the whole world, and everyone wants to buy it because it's so good. But they think they're tough. And they are. They're maybe the fourth most powerful army in the world, right after Russia and the United States. They may be their third, who knows, right after the EU. They're fourth in firepower. So they think they're strong. But God has a burden against them, against Israel, because he wants them not to trust in their weaponry and cleverness and wealth, but in him. And So this is what he asks them to do in verse 1. Thus says the Lord, Zechariah 12:1 who stretches out the heavens. He said, think of me as the one who created the cosmos. I am the one who stretches out the heavens. I'm the one who lays the foundation of the earth. Remember how the Greeks said it? Geos. So cosmos, the universe, geos, the, the whole planet earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Numos. That's the word for breath. He said, so I'm the stretcher out of the universe. I'm the former of the, the one who formed the earth, and I'm the one who breathes life into you. Wow. Can you get anybody bigger than that? He said, that's the one that wants your attention. And Israel won't give them their attention. Now, something fascinating right now, we'll get to this next time, because we're going to get to what is going to bring them to Jerusalem. What's going to bring them to Jerusalem is God says the Jews are building a temple. And that's how Lindsay didn't think of that. God did. And do you know what the Jews are doing today? I, I clipped it out of the magazine. Out of the Israel INN, Israel News Network. 
It's called Israel National News. It, it's, it's their local CNN. It's not Christian. It's not Messianic. It's, it's Israeli. You know what it said on October 12th? Jews in the town of Mitzvi Yeriko are taking practical steps in preparing for the building of a temple in Jerusalem. They are preparing the descendants of the Kohanim, the priests, and the Levites for service. Doesn't that sound like a Sunday school lesson? Doesn't that sound like it's Christian? Doesn't that sound like it's prophetic? It's not. It's secular. It's Jews. It's them. And they're saying, we're going to have a school to prepare temple priests to learn exactly how to conduct daily temple services to offer the required sacrifices. And that school has an exact replica of the temple. And they're celebrating the feasts. And Baruch Marzel and Michael Ben-Ari and all these other Jewish people talk about they're going back to their roots. Now, do they know that, that Jesus said they were going to build a temple? No, they don't like him. Do they know that Paul saw their temple? They don't like Paul. They know John, the apostle, described it in detail? They don't like John either. Why are they doing that? Because God keeps his promises. And the God, in verse 1 of Zechariah 12, who stretched out the heavens, who laid the foundation of the earth, who put the spirit of man within each of us, wants their attention. And they won't give it to him. So you know what he's offering to us? Will you give me your attention? God says, I'm working with the church right now. Israel is in unbelief. I've temporarily set them aside. I'm going to bring them back. But before that, I want your attention. Tonight, does God have your attention? Do you read your email first or your Bible? Do you pray first? Or do you update your Facebook and let everybody know every sneeze you make in life? Isn't it fun to know what everybody's doing, how I feel right now? Does God know how you feel? Do you spend as much time praying as you do twittering or emailing or messaging? Do you get pained when you see sin like God says his saints do? Or do you pain God because you are entertained by sin? You know what God's asking? I want someone to pay attention to me. And that's what he asks us to do tonight. Dear Father, I thank you that you stretched out the heavens and that you found a spot, the only spot in the universe, that can have life like we know it. This whole planet is so designed down to the very levels of the gases in our atmosphere and the tilt of our planet to sustain life, because you made it for us. And that anthropic truth of science points us to the Creator, And all you ask us tonight is, will you pay attention to me? And I pray that in this room, that your eyes would run to and fro, and you would find some of your saints that make a choice in their heart to say, I am going to pay attention to you, God. With my whole heart, I will seek you. I pray that you would show yourself strong in and through those of your people who will pay attention to you, and will honor your name, will listen to your voice, and will hate and flee sin. And we'll thank you for what you accomplish in our lives as we surrender ourselves back more fully to you today. And for your glory, we ask that. And in the name of Jesus, we pray, and all of God's people said, Amen.